Uh, hi everyone. So you could hear me, right? All right. So this talk is about positive LP. So maybe let me begin by defining what positive LP is. So this name, I think, uh, was put forward by uh, Luby and Nissan back to 1993, and it's basically the name that captures the following pair of LPs. One of them is the so-called packing LP, that is to maximize one transpose x subject to the constraint that ax is less than or equal to one in the vector sense, and x is a non-negative vector. In addition, we also require that the matrix A to be a non-negative matrix. So this is the so-called packing LP. Before I give you examples uh, to illustrate packing LP, let me quickly point out that it's LP dual, it's a so-called covering LP, with some of the signs get flipped like this. And this pair of LP is known as positive LP, and it has tons, of, tons and tons of applications. For instance, uh, consider like a company uh, that wants to decide how many products of this type and how many products of this type he wants to produce, and he has some like resource limitation constraints, and maybe like he can make a profit of like 200 bucks for this one and 150 for the other one, okay. Then we all know that this is captured by the following LP, and this one, by the way, falls into the category of packing LP, because if you scale all the constants and you will get a two by two matrix, that is non-negative. That's example one. So profit maximization is one instance of packing LP. As a second example, maximum weighted bipartite matching is also captured by the following LP, with the matrix A being just the incidence matrix of the bipartite graph, and as a simple consequence, it also falls into the category of packing LP. As a third example, the so-called two-player zero-sum game, with only like five lines of proof, one can actually show that uh, it's equivalent to this pair of LP. So I could go on and on to give you examples about you know, applications, of, applications of packing LP, but instead, today, I just want to say that Positive LPs really have tons of applications on the theory side and application side, period. Good. So therefore, like, hopefully you understand that uh, it's an important problem to, to study to begin with. So in today's talk, I will mostly focus on packing LP, and the covering side, its LP dual side, is kind of more involved, so feel free to read our paper. So I will focus on the packing side, and I will discuss with you about how to solve this problem in nearly linear time which is the running time that linearly depends on the number of non-zeros of the matrix A, that is the sparsity of the matrix A, and inversely proportional to the multiplicative error, approximation error of the LP to some constant power C, okay? So here, epsilon is really the most natural thing one can define. We say that we get an epsilon approximation to packing LP if we get uh, a vector that's feasible, that satisfies the polytope constraint, and whose objective value is at least one minus epsilon times the best objective value of this LP. So, we are not the first person, uh, first group who studied this problem. So there exists already like a very, very long sequence of work uh, focusing on how to solve packing LP fast. Starting maybe from Luby and Nissan, and the sequence is probably too long that you cannot even recognize the names. But here's one structured way for me to summarize the prior work. They can be divided into two classes. One of them starts with the famous multiplicative weight update methods. So in fact, one of the original reasons that multiplicative weight updates were introduced uh, was just to solve packing LP. And the running time is this. So on one hand, it's pretty good. It has like an epsilon square dependency like on the arrow. But on the other hand, in front of the big N, which is the sparsity of the matrix, there is a factor that is rho multiplied with the optimum of the objective. Here, rho is the maximum entry of the matrix, so typically known as the width of the problem. So if one does some simple computation, he can notice that rho times opt is always between one and the positive infinity, and therefore this running time in the best case could be Great, but in the worst case, you know, could not, uh, may not even necessarily be a polynomial time algorithm. So that's not so pleasant, but it was only the beginning of this line of research. Shortly after that, uh, 
Optimization experts discovered the so-called accelerated gradient descent method. When applying this to multiplicative weight updates, one can make the dependency on epsilon to go to a single epsilon, okay, instead of epsilon squared. But unfortunately, uh, it still has the width term in it. In a seminal work of Beanstalk and Inger, they managed to improve this width term to n, okay? So this is now a polynomial time algorithm. And the best known algorithm in this line of work uh, is due to these two separate, but actually simultaneous works, although the years like, do not match. That's because like, optimization journals have like, a longer publication cycles. But anyways, they are simultaneous works. And they managed to improve n into square root n, but with like, an additional like, pre-processing time. So this line of work is typically known as the so-called width-dependent solvers because in front of this linear factor n, there are always like uh, factors that are super constants. And let me summarize the best known result here. This is in contrast to another line of research that starts from Lubia Nissan and uh, a very famous work over there is due to Bartol, Bios, and Russ in which they obtained actually, actually a nearly linear time algorithm to solve this which is a running time that linearly depends on n, but has, like, unfortunately, unfortunately uh, one over epsilon square convergence. So this line of research is known as uh, with independent solvers, because there's no other factors in front of n. And there are actually lots of follow-up works to this Bartos, Bios, and Rust result, but unfortunately, this one over epsilon square factor has never been proved since, like, 1997. In short, this is what we got. We got an algorithm that finally converges uh, these two lines of research. That is, we get a running time that not only beats the best known like with dependent solvers that has been, up to, has been the best for roughly 10 years, and we also have beaten the uh, best with independent solver. So this is our work. And let me try to give you like a highlight in today's talk about how we roughly achieve this. Our first step is to convert this LP problem into a convex minimization problem. That is, after introducing some parameter mu, well, don't worry about it, something less than one, we can define a function f like this. So this part of the, this definition of the convex program, uh, of the convex uh, uh, objective actually has appeared in our prior work published in this soda of this year. So therefore, I would state without proof that this is a convex function, first of all. It has a unique minimizer for sure. And most importantly, for the rest of the talk, it suffices for me to get an approximate minimizer to this function, like this point. As long as its objective difference to the minimizer is at most epsilon opt, I claim that this point x, you could translate it into the x of the original LP, and you will get an approximate solution over there. And therefore, I'm stating without proof that for the rest of the talk, we can just focus on this convex minimization problem. All right? Here is the high-level plan. I am going to build a first-order method to solve this. By first-order method, I mean that I will frequently compute the gradient of the function at some point x, but one key feature of our algorithm is that both on the algorithmic side and on the analysis side, we're going to decompose the gradient into two parts. What we call the truncated gradient, C, and the large gradient, eta. As follows. For each coordinate of the gradient, if it's larger than one, we truncate it to one and define C i just to be one and eta to be the remaining part so that C plus eta equals to the full gradient. If it's less than one, we just define C to be the same as the full gradient and either to be zero. And if it's negative, it's the same. By the way, the gradient will never be less than minus one, so there are only three cases. This is what we call the gradient truncation step. And by the way, that after the gradient truncation step, our truncated gradient will be kind of small in absolute value for each coordinate, and our large gradient either may possibly be large, but it's always no negative, okay? The reason we want to do a gradient truncation is because it allows us 
to apply the so-called gradient descent method on Cassi and Eda separately. And then we are going to also apply a so-called mirror descent method on Cassi itself. Now we get something like three first order methods and we're going to use some idea that we created called the linear coupling that allow us to linearly combine the convergence analysis of all of the three together. And then we will get an even faster algorithm than any of the one of the three algorithms or even two of them itself. Okay, that's kind of the high level part. So, so much for the high level thing. Let's maybe go to the algorithm. Here is how it looks like. Starting from some vector x0, y0, z0 to be like an all zero vector, we do n over epsilon iterations. At the beginning of every iteration, we compute a point x to be a convex combination of the z and the y of the previous round. This is what we call the linear coupling step. And then we compute, we randomly pick a point, uh, an index i, and define C to be the truncated gradient as follows. So it's an all zero vector except at the i-th coordinate. Well, we define it, you know, if you remember this picture, as follows. Whenever the gradient is larger than one, we truncate it to one. Otherwise, we don't change it, okay? So that's the way we define C, the truncated coordinate gradient. And then we apply two steps. Uh, one we call the mirror descent step, one we call the gradient descent step. So here, unfortunately today, I do not have enough time to explain to you why this is a gradient descent and why this is a mirror descent. But suppose you believe me on this, okay? In the rest of the talk, I am going to show you, like, if this is a mirror descent, then what does its convergence look like? And then I would get basically a few lemmas, one for this and the two for this, and then I am going to linearly combine them in order to get it in order to get a final convergence. Okay, that's the plan for the rest of the talk. So that's essentially the end of our algorithm. Pretty short, only maybe six effective lines. And uh, before I move to the next slide, let me quickly, quickly point out that the computational complexity of each iteration is dominated by this, which is at most big N over little n running time in expectation, and therefore the total running time is big N over epsilon, a single epsilon as promised. So therefore, for the rest of the talk, let me tell you like how we use, uh, how we could, like why the, this algorithm produces a point that's, that approximately minimizes this function, okay? So let's first look at the mirror descent step. So mirror descent, actually, without defining it today, it's a synonym for many things like multiplicative point updates or follow the regularized leader. So, um, as long as you have seen maybe any of those analyses, maybe you wouldn't be surprised if I tell you this is the convergence lemma of our mirror descent step. So maybe some of the terms like ring a bell, like this is the potential function before the update, potential function up, after the update. So whatever, here's only one thing that's important on this slide. That is a classical mirror descent will put here this thing and this thing, they will put here the full gradient of the function. But what we proved is a lemma that's weaker. We are only able to get a convergence inequality that's proportional to C, which is the truncated gradient. And this is because we define our mirror descent with respect to the truncated gradient. Okay? So we call this the mirror descent lemma. And also on the gradient descent side, we proved two similar lemmas. Pictorially, they mean that in every single gradient descent step, I can decrease the objective by an amount that is at least proportional to this and at least proportional to this. One of them is with respect to the large gradient, eta. The other one is with respect to the truncated gradient, cosy. So here, like, by constants, I don't necessarily mean the same constants, so don't get confused. So, again, there's only one thing, one key feature that's important here, which is classically, a gradient descent step guarantees something that's with respect to the full gradient. But we prove something again. We prove two things that are both weaker. One with respect to eta, one with respect to Cassie. And we call them the gradient descent lemma one and gradient descent lemma two. Okay? So now comes to the final proof. This is like the only technical thing today that I want to briefly show you. 
So we begin by computing like our objective difference to the minimizer, and let's try to upper bound it. After a few classical steps by convexity, linearity, blah, 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 so here is the first line of our proof that's different from all of the past literatures and all of the machine learning things we have looked up for. That is, we, because we have defined the full gradient to be equal to the, uh, the large gradient and the truncated gradient, of course, in the expected sense, because we have you know, a random choice of the coordinate, but ignoring the probability. Our full gradient equals to you know, the separation of the two, a blue part, a red part. And then we are ready to apply the mirror descent lemma here to upper bound it, and we are ready to apply the gradient descent two lemmas here to upper bound, and things cancel, and uh, we get this inequality. And I claim that we are just essentially done, because by averaging this inequality over all the iterations k, we get the point. We, we get the average of the x being like less or equal to the average of the objective values, and we by applying the inequality above, things telescope and blah blah blah, we get a point whose objective value to the minimizer is small enough. So that's kind of the QED. To sum up, beginning with the uh, packing LP. We first converted it into a purely convex minimization problem, and we expressed the gradient into the truncated and the large parts, like this. And then we apply a gradient descent with respect to both eta and cos c, and we apply a mirror descent, and then we combine the analysis of the three, and we get this result. So I'm quite excited about this result, and to give you a little taste about why I am excited, uh, for instance, uh, remember I said maximum bipartite matching, the way, even in the weighted case, it's a special case of packing LP. And uh, our pseudocode, you know, remember, only has only like six lines, right? Even if you implement it, well, only like 15 lines, like in MATLAB, for instance, it could actually, up to maybe one or two log factors, match the state of the art for the uh, maximum weighted bipartite matching algorithm, which used like linked trees and the fancy data structures. But we got, a algorithm, we got an algorithm which is quite simple. So I think not only of theoretical importance, maybe this work is also of practical importance too. So uh, now maybe one minute for a quick like, personal conclusion. This is my favorite picture uh, connecting the continents of optimization and the computer science. So in this talk, uh, you have heard about maybe how to create new optimization tools uh, to solve the problem on the right-hand side. So, in fact, I want to emphasize that those optimization tools are quite generic. So, they not only apply to, you know, positive LP, but actually to other convex functions as well. So, in today's talk, I don't have time to tell you what are the other applications, but trust me, there are. And in addition, one may ask, are these like the only tools? In fact, in the next talk, my co-author is going to tell you about how to build other tools to solve a problem called graph sparsification. So in the past one or two years, we have been actually relating you know, the two continents in a fairly effective way, and some new connections are under construction. So we think this is like a really new way of creating new algorithms in computer science, and we hope that more and more researchers could join us in this line of research. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs>